You may begin. Thank you. Hello. Welcome to the Good ID HL7 SBL Submission Option Overview Training Module. This training module um, will talk about uh, HL7 SBL Submission Option for the Global Unique Device Identification Database. My name is Indira Kondori. I am the Program Manager for the um, Global Unique Device Identification Database. So in this training module, we will talk about the Good ID HL7 SBL submission process. This is not going to be a technical um, training module. This is purely a process overview of submitting via the HL7 SBL option to Good ID. We will talk about the FDA electronic submissions gateway, the acknowledgments that will um, be received by you through this process, how to do testing, what are the testing requirements, using third-party submitters um, for your submissions, and some key pointers to keep in mind as you begin this uh, process on how um, to edit HL7 SBO submissions, and finally, how you can contact us for um, additional information or any questions you may have. So to start off with a very quick overview, the Unique Device Identification System uh, was started back in 2007 through the FDA Amendments Act, where Congress gave FDA the statutory authority to establish a UDI system. In 2012, the FDA Safety and Improvement Innovation Act provided timelines for implementation of the UDI system. In 2012, we came out with a UDI proposed rule, and in 2013, a final rule was um, issued. Um, we strongly recommend that you take some time to visit the CDRH Learn um, portion of the FDA website and look for additional training information and training webinars on the final rule, an overview of the Global Unique Device Identification Database, or what we refer to as the Good ID. Um, so you should refer to the Good ID Overview, a training webinar on Good ID Accounts, and then a training webinar on Good ID the device identifier record. Ideally, you would be viewing this training module after you have had an opportunity to go through the prior uh, training webinars that I just mentioned. That would make the uh, provide you the most um, beneficial information. Um, it's best viewed in a sequential fashion. A quick overview on compliance dates. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the compliance dates. They are all September 24th, uh, pretty much every year all the way through 2016, and then um, again in 2018 and 2020. And on the right-hand column, we show you the class of device that must be a UDI on the label and the data that must be submitted to GoodID. Um, today is July 23rd, and our immediate focus right now is on the first row there for Class 3 devices and devices licensed under the, under the Public Health Act which are due to be submitted to Good ID by September 24th and must have a UDI on the label. So what is a UDI? A UDI uh, stands for Unique Device Identifier. It's composed of a device identifier portion and a production identifier portion. The DI is the mandatory or a fixed portion of the UDI that's static, and it identifies a specific version or a model of the device and the labeler for that device. The PI is a uh, variable portion, and it may be composed of any of the five items listed on the slide, the lot or the batch number, serial number, expiration date, manufacturing date, and for human, cellular, and tissue-based products, the distinct identification code. Now, the good ID, as I said, the Global Unique Device Identification Database is a repository of device information, device identification information. Now, the good ID will only contain the DI, or the device identifier, and that is the static portion, the portion that's not changing for a given version or a model. Production identifiers are not submitted to or stored in the good ID. Instead, what we collect in good ID is we ask you to indicate to us which of the production identifiers are on the label of the device. So um, users would say yes or no to say lock number. If the lock number is on the label of the device, the answer would be yes. If it's not, then the answer would be no. So that's the only information we collect about a production identifier in the good ID. So the DI record, we'll talk quite a bit about the DI record and how to submit it via the HL7 SPL submission option. 
So very quickly, a device identifier record is basically the device identifier, which is the primary key, and the other attributes that we collect in Good ID. And most of the Good ID attributes come directly off of the label or the labeling of the device, and we've listed a few here, um, the brand name, GMD and description, catalog number, um, production identifier lot number. It's on the label, so in this case, in Good ID, as I mentioned before, um, the answer would be yes. We would ask, is the PI lot number on the label of the device? And the answer that would be stored in Good ID would be yes in this case. For single use, yes or no, um, the name of the labeler and the physical address of the labeler. Any contact information uh, would be listed also. Um, this would be the number that customers would call if they want additional information about the device. The actual UDI, even though uh, we only collect the DI, uh, storage and handling, the count of the device, how many devices are within this package. Um, this is the expiration date and then, of course, the size of the device. So these are some of the attributes. A good way to think about uh, a DI record is it's a subset of what might be on the label of the device or the labeling of the device. So moving on, this uh, slide provides a pictorial overview of the Good ID, um, the Global Unique Device Identification Database. On the left-hand side in the blue box, um, you see two submission options. There is the Good ID web interface and the Good ID HL7 SPL submission option, which is the main focus of this training module. So very brief, briefly, the Good ID web interface um, allows um, users, the labelers of device identification information, to submit the information via the manual entry process. So they, it's a secure web interface. They would obtain um, login information, login, and submit device information one at a time manually. The HL7 SPL submission option would allow folks to submit information as an XML file, and we will um, go more in depth on this in just a moment. The right hand side, um, the pink box has Good ID search and retrieval options. Public users can search the Good ID database by logging into the, um, by accessing the web interface. Or in the future, we're planning to offer web services and download capability. These are currently under development. The search and retrieval option overall at the moment has been disabled, mainly because the number of records in Good ID are still, um, you know, there aren't enough records in the system to open up for public searching. As of yesterday, we had about a thousand records in the database. Um, so once we have sufficient records, we will open this up for public access. So that's a quick overview of the system overall. Now jumping um, further into the HL7 SPL submission option. So what is HL7? HL7 stands for Health Level 7. It's a standards development organization that works in the healthcare space, and they develop messaging standards uh, to transfer healthcare information seamlessly across um, different platforms. SPL stands for Structured Product Labeling, and as I mentioned earlier, um, the attributes in Good ID are a subset of what would be in the label or the labeling of a device. Um, so what we've done in Good ID is taken this structured product labeling standard. We have constrained it to the Good ID use case um, so that folks can submit device information as XML files. And we've basically formatted the structured product labeling so you can submit it to us as an XML file. We provide you the technical specifications on the website, and you send the submission via the FDA Electronic Submissions Gateway, which gets routed to CDRH, and then eventually will make its way to the database. Um, we'll talk more about ESG in just a moment. And just note that any labeler choosing this option must complete testing prior to submitting via the product to the production system. And that's mainly to make sure that um, the software solution that you've come up with um, works and the XML submission option and the format that you put together um, is valid and can successfully be loaded to Good ID. And we'll talk more about that as well. So the process then, if, if there is a labeler wanting to use the HL7 SPL submission option to submit to Good ID, would be to register with the FDA electronic submission gateway. Um, complete the electronic submissions gateway testing. They have their own testing that needs to be completed. Then you would request a test 
Good ID account, and text Good ID account will be provided to anyone who wants to submit via the HL7 SPL option, so you can complete your testing. Once you complete your testing, you would request um, and obtain a production Good ID account, which will then enable you to submit production Good ID records. So let's go through this one at a time. We'll start with the FDA ESG. So as I mentioned, FDA ESG stands for the FDA Electronic Submissions Gateway. This is the way that the entire FDA receives um, secure regulatory submissions. And the gateway receives them, and they route the submission to the appropriate center. In our case, it would be um, CDRH. And similar to the good ID, the gateway also provides two submission options. One is a low volume option, which is called a web trader, where you log in um, and upload one file at a time, or a high volume option where you set up your organization's gateway server to communicate with our gateway server, and submissions get picked up by our ESG on a periodic basis and you will receive acknowledgments for each stage of the report transmission. And we'll go through this in just a moment. And a lot more information about the ESG, their testing requirements, and how to um, set up as a partner is all available on the FDA ESG website, and I've provided the web link right on the slide for your use. So let's talk about acknowledgments and how submissions would come to the good ID. So the labeler would send their submission, and the submission would then go um, hit the ESG, and the ESG will say, I got your file, and they will send an acknowledgement back to you, the labeler. That's the acknowledgement one. And at this point, your file hasn't been opened. All they're telling you is, we got a package from you. The gateway will then take that file and they will send it to CDRH because you will note in your submission that the center that it should go to is CDRH and the submission type is good ID. So it gets sent to CDRH and the gateway will send you a second acknowledgement and that acknowledgement will basically tell you CDRH has received your submission. And then CDRH will send that submission, um, will open CDRH once they receive it, CDRH receives multiple electronic submissions, and therefore we note that this is the submission type is good ID, and we send it to the good ID parser. The good ID solution parser will basically then open the file at this point and will go through your entire XML and try to load it to good ID. And finally, we send you acknowledgement three, which will tell you if your submission passed or your submission failed. So that's how the acknowledgement works. So at each step of the process, you basically get a note telling you what's going on with your submission. So let's look at the acknowledgement themselves. So the acknowledgement one, uh, if you notice, I have a red box around here on the top. It provides you a message ID. So every submission gets assigned a message ID by the gateway and that message ID is important for you to hang on to. At this point, if you remember the prior slide, you've just sent your slide, the gateway is telling you, I got it. So here, this message disposition notification on the top is basically say, the message to which this MDN applies was successfully processed. So the gateway is telling you, I got your submission. Then remember, it looks and sees which center it's meant for. It sends it to CDRH, and in this case, it's telling you CDRH has received your submission. At this point, um, it's made it successfully past gate two. Here, it assigns the message ID again, and you also get a new thing called a core ID. You just, just keep track of these, and we'll connect all these in just a moment. Then we go um, in CDRH, they open up the file and they say, hey, this submission type is good ID, so we need to send it to the good ID parser. It goes to the good ID parser. And here, if you see, um, we provide you the report ID. The report ID is the primary device identifier number for that device record. And then we tell you if your submission passed or your submission failed. In this case, the acknowledgement is saying this submission passed. That means that you are device identification information was successfully loaded to Good ID. Now, the way to connect these three acknowledgements is acknowledgement three provides you a core ID, so you can take the core ID and connect it to acknowledgement two, and then you take the message ID from acknowledgement two and you connect it with message ID from acknowledgement one. 
And folks have asked us, why don't you just give us all three in Acknowledgement 3, I mean all two, both Message ID and Core ID. Uh, we would love to do that. However, at the moment, the gateway does not provide the Message ID to us in a possible format that we can grab and slap on in Acknowledgement 3. So unfortunately, this is the only way to um, connect the three acknowledgements and group them together. Now, occasionally, you may see another acknowledgement type coming out as the Good ID processor, which will tell you this is an unidentified or an unparsable submission type. Now, this happens when we open up your file. Either you didn't tell us that the submission type was Good ID or your submission was not validated against the Good ID schema that we provided. So we don't know what to do with it. You know, we open the file, but we don't know whether we should send it to the Good ID parser, the address event parser, or what to do with this at this way, at this time. All we can tell you is we don't know what submission type it is, so we don't know what to do. So if you get a acknowledgement tree that just provides you a HTML um, file like this, um, that's the main reason. But if all goes well, you would get an XML acknowledgement tree, and that would provide you the status. If the status failed, we would provide you the error messages and let you know why it failed so you can fix it. So moving on, so now that you understand the ESG, in order to use the ESG to submit a good ID, you first need to request a test ESG account. Um, and in order to do that, you also need to obtain a digital certificate and you need to send a letter of non-repudiation to the ESG. This whole process takes at least about two weeks, if not longer, so plan accordingly. The letter of non-repudiation is basically um, telling the ESG and the FDA that your digital certificate is similar to your wet signature, and you also tell us who in your company are um, authorized to submit a particular submission type on behalf of your organization. So once that's done, the ESG will provide you with a test account. Um, using your test account, you need to do um, ESG testing, and it's not too complicated. There is a connectivity test you need to do to make sure that if you do the AS2 connection, your system and the ESG system are able to communicate. And then they also ask you to do a load test um, with a large submission. Um, and once you complete that, your ESG testing is done. Then um, if you have existing test accounts, you may reuse those. You don't need to go through requesting another ESG account just for good ID purposes. We know several CDRH customers have existing ESG test accounts for adverse events. You may reuse them. In that case, you don't need to go through the steps that we just talked about. So once you're done with that, you can begin testing for good ID. And please be sure to specify the center of CDRH and the submission type as good ID so that the gateway knows to route it to the correct center. And once it comes to CDRH, we know, um, you know, what submission type it is so we can route it to the appropriate parser. Moving on, let's talk now about SPL testing. So you completed, you got your ESG account, you completed your test ESG um, testing requirements. Now you're ready to do SPL testing. So the first step, obviously, is you have to work on generating your DI record information on XML files. Um, remember, the technical specs are on the Good ID website. Uh, make sure you review that and generate your XML file. Request a test Good ID account, and the account request process is the same um, account request process that's listed on, in our training webinar, and it's listed on our website. You just need to let us know that it's for a test account and then do thorough testing. Thorough testing would include, um, you know, trying to do realistic test scenarios and making sure that all your product lines that you plan to submit are tested adequately, and it's in your best interest and in our best interest to make sure testing is adequate and robust enough that you have an opportunity to identify any issues that may arise during testing and not wait till you go to production. Then you need to complete some test scenarios that we have laid out. It's in the test criteria document in our HL7 SPL implementation package. The test scenarios are honestly the bare minimum. Um, once you complete those, if you just complete those test scenarios and you say, I've done all um, good ID testing, um, you know, I, we don't believe that that would be sufficient. You need to do thorough testing for every product line before you say, I'm going to do the test scenarios that are required and submitted to 
the UDI staff and request a production submission. So um, thorough testing, then complete the test, the required test scenarios we've had, and there are four test scenarios at the moment. We are looking to uh, make some changes to this based on some of the lessons learned uh, we've picked up up to this point, and that will be coming out a little later. But for now, complete the required test scenarios in the package, and once you are completed, you then send a FDA UDI help test case and you provide the primary device identifier and the core ID, and we just talked about the core ID for those four successful test scenarios. Send them through the help desk. What we will do is we'll review the test scenarios and the submissions associated with them and then provide you with the green light and the next steps on how to move to production with ID submissions. Now let's talk about third parties as several labelers are very interested in using third parties uh, um, to do HL7SPO submissions. Now third parties can provide, as we see it, um, two types of services to a labeler. One would be to enable the labeler to um, generate HL7SPO files. So they would provide a software solution or a tool um, to generate the XML file and then the labeler will then um, have an ESG account. They will then just send the submission via the electronic submissions gateway. In this case, the labeler will obtain the test electronic submissions gateway account. The other option would be the third party will do everything. They would provide end-to-end -end solution. They will help the labeler generate the good ID data as an XML file. And in addition to that, they will also take care of sending the submission via the electronic submission gateway on behalf of the labeler. In this case, the third party will have the electronic submissions test account, and the labeler will then need to send a letter of non-repudiation to the ESG, and on that, in the letter, the labeler has to indicate the third party is authorized to submit um, information on their behalf. Now, regardless of which option a labeler chooses and how they plan to use the third party, for a good ID, um, the labeler has to provide the third party information during the account request. So when you request a good ID account on that account request, you need to say, I plan to use a third party to submit good ID information, and here is the uh, identifying information for the third party. Again, if you are unfamiliar with this, I strongly recommend you take a moment and listen to the webinar on Good ID Accounts, which goes through great detail um, on how to obtain a Good ID account and all the details that are necessary. So what we are doing is we are allowing the third parties to test their solutions. We are providing test accounts to third parties so they can um, do testing before they bring on their clients. So if you as a labeler um, plan to use a third party and the third party tells you we've completed all testing and we're ready to go and we're going to submit your data to uh, production, good ID, um, just, just, just pause for a second and make sure that, um, you know, they do testing with your t test data. As we indicated before, it is very important to test with realistic um, data so that every product line and the business rules associated with the different good ID attributes are thoroughly tested. So you as the labeler, therefore, is responsible for fulfilling good ID submission requirements, so it's your responsibility to make sure those production submissions are correct. So therefore, even if you come across working to a third party who says, I've done all the testing, I'm ready to go, you must still go through the process. You must obtain a test good ID account. You must complete the four required test scenarios. But we, again, recommend you do thorough testing. Once all of that is done, you can then get a production good ID account. Again, um, you may work with the third party as a labeler, but we, um, the FDA, are going to hold the labeler responsible for fulfilling good ID submission requirements, which means ensuring they're received and processed by the FDA, reporting within the required time frame, and any record keeping that is necessary. So now, just to, to, to provide a perspective to the third party, so if you are a third party solution provider and you want to um, provide a solution and, um, um, and help your client submit um, to the good ID, 
what we again allow you to do is you may test your solution um, independently of having any clients. So you may not have any clients. You may work on your solution. You request a good ID test account. Let us know it's for HL7 SPL testing. We provide that for you. We can even provide you dummy data for certain attributes such as GMDN codes of the listing number um, upon request so that you can do your testing. And this will enable you to make sure your solution is robust before you bring on clients. The only thing we don't allow you to have is good ID production accounts because production submissions are should be by labelers only. Therefore, at third parties, you don't get any production good ID accounts. Um, and then as you work with labelers, you must do the testing and complete all the testing processes for every labeler client that you bring on. Again, to reemphasize, the reason this is so important is um, the data sets and the attributes that are applicable to each product line is, are different, and the business rules associated with each attribute are different, and we want to make sure that everything is thoroughly tested before you move on to production submissions. So now let's talk about some pointers um, that we would like to share based on what we've learned so far. Um, we strongly suggest that you take a moment to read the Good ID Guidance for Industry and FDA staff document. We're finding HL7 SBL submitters to just go to the technical um, implementation guide and not taking the time to read the guidance. It's important to have an overall understanding of the key concepts associated with good ID, so please take the moment to read the guidance for industry document. Um, it is truly the starter document, I would say, and the SPL implementation guide and the associated um, documents or companion documents. Make sure you allow adequate time for ESP setup and testing. That does take a good bit of time, so start early, and you can do this in parallel as you start working on your good ID solution. And remember to specify the center is CDRH and submission type is good ID. We've received several help desk um, questions where people don't specify that and it goes to the wrong place. And again, the good ID testing completion criteria is the bare minimum. You need to do thorough internal testing before you call it a day. And do not submit the sample message we have in our implementation package as a test submission. It's not a validated sample. It is only there for illustrative purposes only. Um, the draft DI record state is not available. Um, again, I, I have to point to a prior webinar on the DI module for this, uh, where we talked about the different DI record state. In HL7 SPL, you can only submit records in the unpublished or the published date. Unpublished date is when the published date is set to be in the future, and published date is when the published date is either today or in the past. Um, once you do submit your HL7 SPL submission, you can review the submission by logging into the Good ID web interface as an LDE user. The only thing you need to make sure is that you have access um, to the uh, uh, label or dunce number that you use for that DI record. And when you pull it up, the screen will show you the, um, the date that the uh, record was last modified and the number of the DI record. And for all SPL submissions, the user will be shown as SPL user. Um, we also have a folder structure that we have specified. And for various purposes, this has found to come um, this has turned out to be a difficult concept, it appears, for folks to grasp. Um, just to reiterate, the folder structure that we are requesting uh, folks to follow is that there is a top-level folder, which we're calling uniquely named folder. For example, it could say Good ID Test Submission 1 and Good ID Test Submission 2. Whatever unique name um, suits your purpose. Under that, there should be a lower-level folder that must always be called SPL. So it must always say SPL. And Inside that SPL folder is where you place the XML with the device identification information, and you always call that submission.xml. And please don't include any other files within that SPL folder, and you can only have one submission.xml file within each folder structure. So how do you submit multiple files? Um, if you want to submit multiple files, um, you need to have the ESG AS2 connection and then you can drop in your ESG AS2 connection 
both good ID test submission one and test submission two at a given time. You can drop 10 files, you can drop as many files as you want, but every single folder structure can only contain one submission.xml and therefore just one BI record within it at the moment. And the impossible um, HTML acknowledgement three message that I talked about earlier, you would see that frequently if you don't follow the um, folder structure as we have specified. So let's talk briefly about editing SPL submissions. Um, <clears throat> once you submit the initial um, DI record, any edits you make, you must submit the entire DI record all over again. And some key attributes to keep track of is um, the document that set ID. So the set ID is an attribute in the HLS and SPL message. This is what allows us to link um, the all the submissions. So it allows us to group submissions, if you will, into a single one. So it links the initial submission to any edits that were that have been made. Um, the document dot version number is what you need to increment by one. This is what tells us which version is the most recent, and the highest number is what we are going to consider to be the most recent. And the DI record then will be overwritten with the most recent file. So every time you edit a DI record, you must include all the attributes, the changed attributes, and the unchanged attributes. Make sure you use the same set ID you used for initial submission, and make sure you increment the uh, portion number. So that's key for editing. Now, beyond that, I ask you to please refer to the um, Good ID guidance document for additional editing information and also refer to the DI record module webinar for information on editing. What I'm going to do on this slide is just to reiterate some key points, and that is our recommendation for all labelers is that you use the same submission option you use for initial DI entry for all edits to the DI record. So, what that means is if you enter the record via the web, you stick to using the web interface for all edits to that record. If you enter the record via the HL7 SPL option, you make all edits to that record via the HL7 SPL option. And the key is, the reason is that when you enter a record through the web, we just talked about the set ID and the version number. That record will not have a set ID or a version number. So, um, ability to group records and make sure the initial record is linked correctly to the um, um, edits gets a little complicated, and therefore that's our overall recommendation to you. Having said that, we understand that um, you, the labelers, need flexibility in editing and managing your records. Therefore, here are some additional items to note. So if you have an unpublished DI record and you enter the initial record via the web, you cannot edit that record via SPL in the unpublished DI record state. Now, if you enter the record via SPL, you may edit that record via the web interface. Again, as I mentioned, um, <clears throat> when you make edits um, via one option and enter via one option and edit via the other option, there are um, potential for record inconsistencies so in this case, you entered the record via SPL, and then you edited via web interface. If you did not carry over the changes you made via the Good ID web interface into your source system, then the information in your source system and what's in Good ID will not be consistent. And that's the main reason why we recommend you stick to the same option. Now, when we move to the published DI state, um, again, I ask you to go back to other webinars to talk about the during the grace period and after the grace period. So during the grace period, any record you entered via the web interface cannot be edited via SPL option, but if you enter the record via SPL, you can edit it via the web interface. Now once you pass the grace period, same thing right now, if you enter a record via the web, you cannot edit via SPL. However, we are planning an enhancement to allow for this capability. We do not have timelines to share with you at the moment, but based on user feedback, um, we are going, we are working to see if we can implement this in the near future. Um, stay tuned for timelines. Now, if you enter a record via SPL, you may edit via the web interface. So to summarize again, 
at the moment, if you enter a record via the web, you cannot edit it via SPL at any time. Um, we are planning to allow you ability to edit after the grace period. Now, if you enter a record via SPL, you can edit via the web interface at any time throughout all three BI record states. However, please remember that you need to make sure that the data in the ID and the data in the source system stay consistent. Moving on, um, again, this I have to refer you back to a prior webinar and the draft good ID guidance document. You would know that um, after the grace period passed, there are certain attributes that can no longer be edited, and these are the new DI trigger attributes. Now, if you need to edit a new DI trigger attribute after the grace period, um, there is a way to do that. However, um, we expect this to be an extremely rare occurrence. So before you publish a DI record, you need to make sure your data is accurate and it's ready to go. However, if you need to change it in those rare circumstances, you can contact the FDA UDI help us with your request. We will review your request, and we will move the record from a published to an unpublished state. And in the unpublished state, the editing is unlimited. You can make your edits, and then you can publish your record again. So that's a nutshell about editing. That's a lot of information. Um, again, please go back to the appropriate prior webinars and documentation so it sort of all comes together for you. Um, DI record submission overall, therefore, then um, you would start by submitting your record as unpublished DI records, um, and then you work with us on data quality. Data quality is an important component of our program, and once we um, do a data quality review, we'll provide you information on any edits or updates you need to make to your records and therefore to your source systems or your HL7 SPL solution. Once you do that, you will be ready to publish your DI records. Now, as you publish your DI records via SDL, we've gotten quite a bit of questions on submission volumes. Our recommendation is that you start slow. Um, once you are ready to do production submissions, start in small batches, perhaps start with 10 records. Make sure you get all three acknowledgments for those 10 records, then go to 20. Make sure you get all acknowledgments for those 20, then go to 30. Then slowly increment it up as it works for your particular situation. And we also ask that you don't submit more than 500 records at any given time. So at any time, when you drop submissions to uh, via the ESG, we ask that the maximum should be 500. And don't drop more than 500. Make sure you get acknowledgments for all of that, that, that entire batch before you drop another large batch. Um, that's, what it, that's the maximum we would like to um, entertain at the moment. This would help you make sure you don't have a huge load out there with issues perhaps on Act 3, but you are waiting on us to troubleshoot. And same for us. If you're submitting production records and you're not getting acknowledgement fee, we don't want to have to troubleshoot 1,000 records. We would rather just keep it at uh, 500. So the message is every time you drop a load, make sure you get all acknowledgements for that load before you drop the next load, whatever the number might be that might suit you with the maximum not to exceed 500. Um, system status is important, just like any other system. We will have downtime, scheduled downtimes. We will post on the UDI website. Look for the Good ID System Status section of the web page. Um, there will be unscheduled downtime, sometimes reported by you, the user, unfortunately. Um, at times, we won't have a lot of heads up. Um, those times, we will um, post the information as soon as we become aware of it. We recommend that you subscribe to email alerts on Good ID, where we send um, email notifications when we are aware that the system is going to be down. How to contact us? Um, for any ESG question and for all Acknowledgement 1 and Acknowledgement 2 issues, we recommend you send a note to ESG help desk at fda.hhs.gov. And as if you recall from this earlier slide, Acknowledgement 1 and 2 come from the ESG, so we don't control that process. So if you are waiting for Acknowledgement 1 or 2, please send your um, inquiry to them. That makes things faster. But for everything else, you contact us via the UDI help desk, whether it's the hl 7 SBO submission process, the Acknowledgement 3 issues, good idea account request, regulatory questions, technical questions, that's your one-stop shop. 
And what happens is you um, there is a form on our website. It is very simple. You fill the form out and with very few attributes there and you submit your question. The question will become a case in our help desk tool and we will email the response to you. And if you ask follow-up questions, you just hit a reply to that email. It will append your case in our tool um, and will help us manage any questions from you and we make sure that um, all inquiries are addressed in as timely a fashion as possible. Just make sure that you can receive emails from the help desk. We've received um, comments from users where it's ended up in their spam folder and they've been waiting and waiting and they thought that we did not respond to them. And that brings this presentation to a conclusion. Thank you for your attention and if you have further questions, contact us via the FDA UDI help desk.